It's an extremely dynamic tension. It's old versus new, skill versus concept, tradition versus innovation. Uh, and tonight, Tom versus Tom. Uh, we are lucky to have two creative geniuses with us that represent both ends of our spectrum. Uh, in this corner, Tom Wolf, one of America's best known and best selling authors. He's credited with creating the new journalism movement, uh, along with the likes of Hunter Thompson and Gay Taliz. He is also an artist and an illustrator. Uh, who has designed the covers of several of his own books. Uh, he has expressed his strong ideas about art and design through several books and essays, including The Painted Word and From Our House to Bauhaus. Um, in those books, he's made the case that theory has become too important in art and that the art world is too controlled by a small, elitist network of critics, dealers, and collectors. By the way, he's rumored to have a new book coming out in 2016. Um, I was trying to meet with him for a couple weeks over the summer, um, and he kept delaying me because he was on deadline. So um, I think the deadline's finished by now. Yeah, no, I, I, I still, still, still got, got some scrub me up to do. So okay, okay, but um, anyway, so we finally did. We finally did get together and had a. Um, a great afternoon. Um, in this corner, Tom Sachs. Tom is an artist, uh, primarily a sculptor. He's best known for his elaborate recreations of uh, cultural icons and luxury brands through duct tape, foam books, foam core, and police barricades. Um, like Tom Wolf, Sachs idolizes astronauts. Um, and that theme has continued through his space program, NASA, and Mars projects. He's also uh, written many things um, and produced many writings and, and zines on his work, usually also illustrated by him. Um, he is interested in the traditional and the handmade and utilizes them in his work. Um, and though the work may be beautiful, the underlying theme is always conceptual. So whether it's Tom versus Tom, or Tom and Tom, or Tom loves Tom. We'll see how the thing goes tonight. Um, I did want to also say thank you to Magnum Real Estate for um, hosting this event. Uh, we wanted you all to come here to see what our new student housing looks like. <laughs> this, by the way, is a double. It's not a single, so, so you know. Um, and uh, the school itself is just around the corner on Franklin Street between West Broadway and Church. And for anybody who has not been there, um, please come and visit us. We have over 100 studios with a constantly changing array of very exciting, wonderful, and mostly figurative, but not wholly, uh, mostly figurative work. Um, and we hope to see you next week at Take Home a Nude on October 18th. Oh, 15th. Oh, my God. <laughs> And by the way, it's at Sotheby's, not at the school, so don't show up at the school. Um, Tom Wolf will have a piece in it, and I, uh, I hope uh, by the end of the night, Tom Sachs will agree to have a piece in it as well. Um, this all is just an elaborate setup to get it to know so, um, But for tickets, see the beautiful Allison Hillier over there, or um, go to our website and um, wear white in honor of Tom Wolf, who is one of the honorees. Uh, along with the art critic Jerry Saltz. So without further ado, I give you Tom and Tom. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at uh, the, uh, I detect two new art forms today. Um, one I call no hands art. And the other is tenure art, as in T for Tom, E for Easy, N for Nathan, U R E. Um, yeah. Probably the best examples of no hands art are uh, Jeff Koons and Richard Serra. Um, I was just looking at some pictures today of Jeff Koons and his. The woman he was briefly married to, called La Cuccinella, <laughs> who gained fame through a scandal in Italy, and was still famous when she came here. Um, and they had some pictures taken, Polaroids, I believe, 
of themselves in just about every position that nude bodies can be in. Um, and so you can't imagine, I think. Um, I couldn't imagine that. Um, and these were sent off to some elves uh, in the Midwest and were turned into three-dimensional photographs. He didn't touch, he didn't touch the photographs. They were sent off to some elves in the Midwest, I think it was Cleveland, uh, and they converted them into three-dimensional glass sculptures. Um, which is self-extraordinary something. And there's no, I mean, they, I don't know how many copies of each one there is, but there's no, there's no necessary limit. Um, he's also done 45 foot high rabbits. Uh, other people did them made of dirt. Yeah. Other people handled the dirt. He didn't, he didn't touch a thing. Um, and uh, he's had a number of other uh, uh, works uh, along that line. Uh, now, tenure art is something different. Uh, um, a lot of it is conceptual art. And the idea is to, well, I'll give you an example. This is one I saw near Lakeland, Florida. Um, the artist invited as many people as he could to uh, meet him at, a, at what was actually a, like a small lake. Um, and uh, he had with him a, a really heavy chain, I mean, probably the heaviest I've ever seen, uh, aside from something on a ship. Um, weighed a lot. On either end of the, of the chain, uh, he had a large polyurethane bag full of vegetables. Um, so he laid the chain on top of the water. Uh, and of course, it sank immediately to the, to the bottom. But he was supposed to come back. I think it was two, two months or something. I, did, I, went, I was curious. I went back. Um, and now the chain was lying on, was a stretch across the top of the water. The vegetables had rotted. Uh, in the bag, creating a gas that was enough to uh, to lift it up. Now, I mean, I was astounded, but there's no way you can sell that. Uh, that's where tenure art comes in. Um, most of the tenure artists are conceptual. Uh, if you can do enough things like that, enough uh, works like that, and get some publicity, uh, you have a pretty good shot at getting a job teaching on the faculty. And after six years, it used to be ten years, after six years now you, you get tenure. Uh, and you're not going to live high, but you're not going to have to live hard. Um, you, you'll be paid until your uh, retirement age and then you'll get a pension. Uh, and no more starving artists today. But, uh, so, uh, those are, I mean, I, 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 art has changed uh, a lot since I wrote The Painted Word, oh my gosh, when did that come out? Uh, um, about 19, about 1980, I guess. Is that, no, 1976. Um, and it's, uh, it's exciting. I'm not, I'm not, doesn't have to be great. Um, I, I love those artists, and this year we lost Chris Burden, who is the, the kind of artist who might have done a piece like the chain and the and the gas and the rotting vegetables. And, um, I'm not sure how I fit in with that, but I, I would say that. Um, Because I work with people and I do, I have elves in the Midwest. <laughs> um, but I also have a team of ten people that I work with, and I, I like to think of the studio as a as a teaching hospital, <laughs> where there's a lot of everything's hands on. You can see I, my hands are sliced up, and um, if my hands aren't cut up and callous, it means I'm too busy polishing that uh, plastic keyboard. 
things with my fingertips, writing emails. But um, there's a virtue in making that's still very alive. And um, certainly among some of the number of the artists that are in this room here, we, um, and it might not be the biggest trend right now, but I can, I'm only going to speak to what I do and what I think is important because I'm not devoted to the work of others. Otherwise, I'd be working for them, obviously. <laughs> Very devoted to what, what we do. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I have to admit, you know, I'm a huge fan. I just want that everyone to know. So anything that I say that's smart, 60% of that came from Tom just recycling it. So I just want that to be known. <laughs> And all the dumb stuff's on me. Um, but uh, I did read, uh, reread the in word, um, which is great, and I still, still, still think very relevant, even though, of course, art moves. Um, but I, I guess I, I was taken with um, a couple of things. One, um, uh, there was a passage about Picasso and um, in the pain of the word. I don't know if you remember this. But you did write it. Um, talk no, about. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, he 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 figured out how to um, to get rich gracefully. Yes, and not have holes in his sneakers <laughs> like I'm rocking today. Um, uh, how he would show up at at the events and and. Custom made South Row clothes, and the, versus the, the young artist who shows up at the Museum of Modern Art gala wearing um, paint splatter jeans and at the, at the black tie event mm -hmm. saying, I'm just a kid, don't take me seriously. <laughs> Whereas he managed to figure out how to be bohemian and bourgeois at the same time. Is that fair? And I, I think the main difference, I think, in the things that have changed since that was written now is that there have been some words invented like Generation X or Generation Y and Millennials that have defined um, you know, a different understanding of what wealth and power means in our, in our society. It's, uh, and even since Radical Chic, there's been a different perspective on, on um, the thing in Radical Chic, you say, uh, um, that the history of New York socialite is is as complex as the history of the politics in the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think it's interesting how, uh, and what I loved about the painted word wasn't so much all the art stuff, because I don't like, I don't, I hate art. <laughs> I, you know, and that's I make it because um, if, and no one else is going to do it right, so that's why I do it. That's <laughs> exactly right. I mean, there are a couple of people in this room that do a pretty good job. No offense, but <laughs> not as good as me. You know, <laughs> that reminds me of uh, when Rambo was informed by a journalist that he was considered the greatest. He was 32 years old. Considered the greatest artist in France, uh, and his response was "mid pour la pose," um, which I thought was it showed that he didn't, he didn't care. Right. He absolutely, absolutely didn't care. Um, now, I think Picasso cared. Um, now, as my as I understand it, Picasso quit art school at age 15, saying that there was nothing more they could teach him. Unfortunately, the very next month, or the next semester, rather, um, they were teaching anatomy and perspective. <laughs> um, and if I found myself in a hole like that, I'd invent something called cubism. <laughs> Where there's no perspective, and it really doesn't matter how you draw it. <laughs> uh, but he, 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 that started, uh, that started about exactly 1900, Cubism. Uh, and some of the other artists, uh, friends of his like uh, uh, Brock, for example, uh, <clears throat> um, couldn't stand the, um, 
his kind of cavalier mm. attitude towards uh, uh, towards these things. But um, the the attitude of artists today is is uh, it's pretty interesting to me. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to think that Maurizio. Yeah. Um, had a one of his recent works is 90 called 90 cans of shit, and that's what we get. Um, because this had been done before by oh, what was the guy? Ben Zoning. Yeah, it did, it did something called the shit show, um, and this is part of taking art out of the studio or the studio environment. And pushing it away, and and there's. Do you remember performance art? You don't see much of that anymore. Oh, yeah. um, but performance art. Oh, what is her name? She appears. She doesn't appear naked anymore. Um, Maria. Yeah. yeah. And, and just. Um, I don't know why she quits now. I mean, <laughs> why quit when you've made it to 60 this way? But that's kind of the way it. That's kind of the way it goes. Well, it's authentic. Right? She keeps it going. It's authentic. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of her recent shows. Um, to get to the show, although she's still going naked at this one. Uh, there were two naked people at the door, um, a man and a woman, and you had to squeeze between them. There's no way you could walk between them. You had to squeeze between them uh, to get to, to see the topless lady inside. <laughs> and uh, I suppose that's our of a kind. Uh, well, can, I, can I ask you questions? Yes. <laughs> sure. Not guaranteed to get ready. Yeah. Someplace. Because there's an issue that to me is plaguing me, or it's my it's the focus of not just the art that I make and the other artists in this room make, but it's almost the plague of consumerism and it's this constant search for authenticity. And whether it's Marina not being naked now that she's 70, if that is an expression of inauthenticity or fear or uh, um, nothing ages uh, more ungracefully than a beautiful woman's ego or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, the, the desire for authenticity is, seems like the most valuable thing that we have as culture makers. And um, whether that's authenticity of an experience as told by a writer or the authentic experience of art, where does it come from? Why are these people making these things? Like, why would you make the performance piece you just described? Or why would you make a giant bunny or whatever pictures of you and your girlfriend made into glass? Um, I mean, I think I. I think I know why I do it, but I'm curious if you if you know if you've been able to, through all of your observations of not just art but the world, find a connection between the different kinds of authenticity that people seek and why they make stuff. I think most people who become artists or writers uh, have no idea of making a living. I mean, it just seems somehow you'll do it. Uh, which is kind of is, is it's kind of nice. Um, of course, there's always a danger if you made it with one particular picture or piece of music or whatever it may be that you get uh, you get stuck in that because success you don't want to let that success go. Um, I think it was Barnett Newman who spent the last 22 years of his life uh, trying to work out uh, the problems, if if any, of, of putting. Um, stripes of color aside uh, one another. I think he could have moved on 
he saw them. <laughs> he was so good at it. But it was, people liked it. I mean, the art, the art world. Incidentally, I love the phrase the art world. Mm. The art world, uh, I figured, is made of rather, made up of. Well, I used to, I used to fit in the figure of ten thousand people worldwide. Of whom maybe it's a little more now, but of which uh, about 3,000 were in the United States, and 2,700 of those live in or close to New York. Um, and that's probably changed. It's probably changed a, a little, a little bit. Um, and the idea that the public is turning its back on great art is a laughable, uh, laughable theory um, because they don't see great art. They are sent a memo um, after it's done saying, this is, these, these are the great artists this year. Um, and they either ex accept that or, or they don't. But the, the 3,000, let's say, if that's a correct number in New York, they're, um, Well, they're least of all critics. The critics are messenger boys today. They just get the word from the art world and they bring it to the newspapers. When's the last time you saw a critic on a major newspaper or magazine go out on a limb saying, this, is the, this guy is the greatest uh, you've ever seen when, you, when nobody else was agreeing? It doesn't happen anymore. It used to happen um, where there would be Critics who made uh, made it a point of going out ahead of the, of the crowd, no, no longer. Um, and it's, I think that's kind of a, that, 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 that's kind of a, uh, a shame. But the art world is made up of curators, um, collectors, and gallery owners. Um, and some artists, there are some artists who are a member of that, of that world. Um, and they make all of the decisions. And the same thing is true in Italy, the same is true in France and in England. Um, and it's, it's not a world. It's a, it's a, um, uh, it's a, commu it's a community. Another thing that today, though, I notice is um, if you talk about money in art, there is a uh, very wealthy collectors have a tremendous impact. You know, art is a interesting. If you think of it as a commodity, it's about the only one in which every piece is unique. Uh, you can, you know, books, you can sell uh, 300,000 copies of a book and there's nobody that feels that, they, uh, that they've, they've lost the authenticity of the piece. Uh, but in, in, in art, it's a, a, it, in, in art, it's a different story. Um, it's, some say it's the world's largest unregulated commodities market. That is true. I mean, there are things you can do in the ways you can hype a certain people can hype prices that would be literally against the law. Yeah, it happens. I've seen it. In any any other industry, that was, you can call art an industry. Um, oh, and when you get into esoteric things like furniture, uh, and there's a furniture auction coming up. The planning done by the major dealers, because nobody but the dealers really knows what's going on in the furniture. Um, uh, the planning on who's, uh, on things like who's going to win the auction, uh, is, uh, that wouldn't be allowed either. I mean, it may not even be allowed in the art market. Well, eventually I could see that, that stuff changing, but for now it's still, um, it's still a little, it's still a little gray. 
Um, but to me, going back to the idea of the critics seemed a little heartbreaking. Is, does, did anyone know or study with Sidney Tellum? Do you know Sidney? I must have known. Anyways, it, he said that a, a critic, uh, he wrote for arts and um, uh, other things, and he, he wrote, um, uh, a critic is a man with ideas. I think that's what you were saying, that you rarely see an art, uh, art critic in a newspaper standing up and saying, anything, one way or another, about an artist. Usually, if anything, they'll condemn it, because everyone, loves, everyone says, loves to be a hater, it's easy. Um, but uh, to have an idea about art and to bring it to light is something that I think the artists need, art, the art community needs people with ideas, because I, I, you know, I've got <coughs> ideas about my art and I write about them, but ultimately they're just an excuse for my blue collar activities. I really <laughs> like just putting on bathroom shelves, that's my goal, that's where I'm as good as, that's where I'm like Mike, fast, even with tile, I'm not afraid of drilling in tile. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, community is very important, and we need people with ideas, and the critics that I run into very often use overly complex words like um, to shore up their uncomplex un ideas. I love relational aesthetics. That's one of my favorite ones to hate. I've just been watching um, uh, Hennessy Youngman. Has anyone watched Hennessy Youngman? Okay. Yeah. Does anyone worship at the temple of Hennessy Youngman? <laughs> okay. He's a great uh, critic, art critic, and who is on, his medium is on YouTube, so you can go watch him talk about art on YouTube. And his his bit about relational aesthetics. His relational aesthetics is basically how a have a party, invite all your friends in an art gallery, and um, call it relational aesthetics. <laughs> that's, it, it, it sticks a little better than that, but that's he, he refined, keeps it that simple. Well, what's going to happen when art moves into the area of the Instagram uh, and, and Twitter yeah. tweets? Um, 28,000 followers, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. It's there. I, I, I'm obsessed with it. I'm embarrassed. I'm mortified. It's my crack. I, I recently just unfollowed everyone because I can't control myself. But every image that goes in there, I obsess over. In fact, I just posted about 40 minutes ago saying, with a picture of the sign that was out front saying, this is happening now. And the comments will be things like, what the fuck, man? Why didn't you give me a little fair warning? <laughs> Stuff like that is what I'm going to get. But it is community, and I'm reaching 28,000 people are scanning past that in a tenth of a second. That's not bad, 28,000. <laughs> these are real followers. These aren't random, like, phony, Asian, like, cyborgs. These are real people. <laughs> Marshall McLuhan. Said is in the, about 1967 uh, that uh, you know, in 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 the future there would be no um, really no audience for newspapers and magazines. That, that by itself is true. Um, and he said it's because the new generation—that's people born. 50s, I guess. And he said, are um, uh, they are the television has turned tribal. Now, don't ask me to explain the steps. Television has turned tribal, and tribal people, if handed a piece of paper with writing on it, assume it's a trick. And they won't believe anything that somebody hasn't told them personally. Um, and that has come true. Today, when you think of blogs, um, a blog is that guy whispering in your ear. And I think you, but people really do pay attention to, uh, to blog. Even if the blog says something like, Grocer, I can't remember his first name, 
And the next said, okay, in the block. You can, uh, you can go on like that. Um, there's less and less news is checked. I mean, on, I worked on newspapers here for 10 years, and uh, constantly checking out facts. Constantly checking out facts. Call your paper and make sure you got it right. But if you if you follow a blogger, you're, that's your part of your tribe. You tr you're trusting that person, even if they're crazy, and or about research. Yeah, you know, well, that's um, I, I agree with that. Um, but there's less and less in actual news being being covered. I mean, I enjoy reading the Daily Beast or, or, or several of those uh, online services. But they, they cherry pick. They, they see a juicy story, they run it. But they're not going around on this education beat to uh, uh, just to see what the, the trends are. On the education beat on a newspaper, you're lucky if you've got two stories in the, in the newspaper a week, but you're out there talking all the time. That's a, that's a, that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, I don't know who you trust. Yeah, I don't. I want to say, you know, trust Beyonce, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I haven't been listening to her recently. I've seen her. But oh, is, is there is there art that you love? So there is as much as I hate art, and you know, I always think of what C. Montgomery Burns says. I. <laughs> Who's the evil uh, power plant owner of The Simpsons? Um, I don't know about art, but I know what I hate, and I don't hate this that much. <laughs> and there are things that I love out there, or I should say, the things I don't hate that much. Is there anything that you don't hate that much? Well, my I try not to let this influence my opinions, but my favorite artist worked for a magazine called Simplicissimus. They did social s satire. And they had been influenced by the discovery of Japanese uh, painting, which the discovery was late in the 19th century. Um, and so they were terrific. They were all trained artists. They were terrific at doing features, uh, particularly faces and hands, but they would leave other spaces Blank or just a, a solid, um, a solid color. Um, and people like um, Olaf Goldbranson, one of the best. Uh, Bruno Paul, another. Rudolf Vilka. Um, I, I look at those magazines, you know, simple systems copies over. In fact, I have some some bound and simple systems this big. Um, and you don't see, today, the, the satirical artists are not trained artists most of the time. You can see this in, car, in, in political cartoons. They really do not know any anatomy. It's a standard. Uh, think of how much better it would all be, I don't care what, what side they're on, uh, if they were just masters of the, of the craft. But maybe that's asking. Yeah, I don't. I didn't. I didn't do it that way. <laughs> but I. But I, you know, so much of drawing is is about confidence. Right? It's, it's about having. Um, I think I can draw better than anybody else in this room. But, <laughs> but my way. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. And, and, can't argue with that. It's, uh, I think the greatest thing about drawing as a test, whether you want to do drawings or not, is to indicate you have control, that you can do exactly what you, what you want. And then you can go off. It's almost like a basic training, I think. Then you can go off and do anything you want. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything because that concerns the uh, drawing. And 
today in many ways it, it, it's the conceptual art takes takes center stage. In the in the twentieth century there was a constant attempt to refine art. Um, so cubism becomes a reaction against uh, formal studio work. And then uh, you get all into all the uh, the isms of the, uh, the late teens and the nineteen vorticism and uh, uh, well they left, left impressionism uh, behind but, um, until finally we got to abstract expressionism I don't know how many people remember that, uh, that they could never sell those paintings they could, they could praise them to the skies but nobody would buy them uh, a friend of mine was once on a train uh, with uh, Jackson Pollock coming in from Connecticut. Uh, and he just happened to know Jackson Pollock. And he, Pollock was going over some figures. And it turned out that he was making out his income tax. And his income for that particular year was $2,200. And this is at a time when uh, he had, had double truck spreads in Life magazines, uh, uh, calling him uh, Jack the Dripper. <laughs> Jack the Dripper. You couldn't get any more publicity than that. But they were just not, they were just not selling. That's why um, people love pop art so much. Collectors did. Um, but pop artists could not do anything they wanted. I mean, they had, they had to do things that had already been done. You think of all the love comics that uh, Roy Lichtenstein uh, copied pretty, pretty faithfully. Uh, if you try to do something creative, you would be you would be left out of the loop uh, in, in the pop art uh, era. Um, and of course, that was that was Andy Warhol. Uh, you'd. Uh, he do a, a, a piece about a car wreck. He did several of those. Um, but it was very important that they be painted photographs of, of actual car wrecks rather than something that came out of his um, imagination. And then, but that was finally superseded by um, things that became tinier and tinier in their scope, um, such as Well, you, you, you finally get down um, to, to, to things like uh, the conceptual art in which people try to make it smaller and smaller and smaller until finally you get the uh, a plastic piece. I'm trying to think. Um, I'm trying to think who the, the, the artist was. In which he just had a list of instructions which said um, it's all the way oh, I think it was you're right <laughs> it said you may view the picture or you may view the work of art you don't, but you don't have to uh, and or you can can view it and, and remember it uh, or you don't have to even look at it and this was just, and this was just written. Uh, and that was about as, as tiny as the experience of art you um, could get, other than just simply not looking and not writing. I would argue that the conceptual artists, like the ones you're, the one you're talking about, were actually finding an authentic experience. Whereas, like, if you look at the abstract spread the drippers or the or the Barnett Newman's obsessing about how colors and stripes went next to each other. That I imagine the um, conceptual artists traveling to California, leaving New York, which was 
the people in the art world that left Paris. And you can see, you know, start from the Renaissance across Europe through Paris to New York. And finally winding up at the edge of Western civilization in California, the Malibu <laughs> on the coast looking out the water. And you're like, how the fuck am I going to make art here? You've got Hollywood, which has destroyed the laws of reality, imaginary tales. You've got the military and NASA destroying the laws of physics, making rocket ships that go to the moon and kill God or stealth bombers or whatever. How am I going to make art? And so these guys, I'm thinking like John Baldessari, Bruce Nell, or Saul Witt, or, or my favorite Douglas Hubler, trying to create art. So what they do is they create a set of rules under which they're going to create art because they are, they're up against the existential abyss. There's nothing left. And so John Baldessari bends down on the ground, he picks up four tennis balls and he throws them up in the air and he quickly takes his camera and shoots a picture and, and uh, the piece is called um, Four Balls Thrown in the Air to Make a Perfect Square, Best of 36 Tries. <laughs> and it's kind of, on the film, some of you don't know this, but the film used to have 36 exposures. So. And then the, the art piece was 36 photos, and that was the piece. And although it might sound kind of deadpan and like nothing was really happening there, it was this attempt at finding meaning. And through these really simple gestures, of course, excellent presentation skills, all these guys, um, they were able to find something that communicated about their experience. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I don't know what IYY is doing when he builds a, what should we call it, a piece of sculpture out of 1,200 bicycles. And they are put at different angles upon each other so that finally the tower of bicycles is 900 feet. It's like a, a nine-story building. Um, I didn't know there were that many bicycles oh, in, in, in China. Well, I guess there are. Probably, probably lots of them. Um, this was done on a, uh, a small scale by Gabriel Orozco, no kin to the more famous Orozco. Um, and he did a sculpture of just four bicycles, as much as mine. It's this, there is a, a definite trend towards using things that are already made um, and using them in, 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 different, uh, in, in different ways. Uh, and, and there are people who say that what the New York Academy does uh, is, is unthinkable. That was done in 1645. Um, that's a that's one of the reasons uh, I like the academy so much. It's it's not afraid to be revolutionary. <laughs> it's, a, it's a revolutionary approach uh, these days. And in, 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 in a way, it's too bad that photography exists because in the past you could paint a portrait and. A generation later, everybody assumed that that's uh, that's Sir Henry right. down to the smallest detail because nobody can check yet can, can check it out. Uh, now you can check a lot of these things out. Uh, you know the portraitists often have a saying: uh, "There's a little something wrong about the mouth," uh, and often there is. Uh, but there was in the past nobody had nobody had that. That problem. What the disappearance, uh, gradual disappearance, newspapers are going to do. I, I, uh, what effect that's going to have? I, I don't. I really don't know. Um, can't be, but so good. Well, I have, I have to agree. It's the, the, the school is important because one of the things that the hardest to master about being an artist is. Um, taking time to really see things for what they are. And 
the studio uh, Bible is uh, Lawrence Weschler's book about Robert Irwin. Uh, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing that one sees. And to really see something, you forget what it's called. You just see it for what it is. And there's nothing like drawing that forces you to do that. If you don't, you can't draw without seeing it. You can, you can, it kind of can, but it becomes a doodle or a scribble. But really by seeing how light hits an object, there's no more meditative act. And it's one of the foundations for thinking about stuff. And without thinking about things, it's not really art. Unless it's, I don't know, some kind of primal scream art thing where it's just about your in. But, um, and I think that's got great virtue, so I'm with you. Well, I learned, uh, well, I think I learned, anatomy by doing drawings of boxes in Ring magazine. That was great. I mean, you, you really get a lot of angles and bodies and so forth. The one problem is their hands are covered with these gloves. <laughs> so then I realized <laughs> that it became an obsession with me, learning to draw hands. Um, and now I, I must confess, I judge most realistic work. First I, first I go to the hands. What do, you, what do you think of Leonardo? I'm trying to remember. Well, he's I, famous I for being bad at drawing hands, right? That's one of the weird things about means like the artist, right? Well, that was certainly true of uh, a lot of people in the era of Brock uh, Owens and, of course, Picasso. Well, Picasso had been so distorted, he didn't, he didn't have to draw. He didn't really have to draw hands. Um, but others, when they were in the, the early modern art, they were still doing figures. Um, it was ingenious the way they would hide the hands behind the back, <laughs> reaching into a pocket, you know, because they just couldn't do them. Because you've got five different planes uh, that, you're, uh, that you're working with. Um, man, I shouldn't be so narrow-minded as to look at, keep looking at hands like that. It's, it's the ultimate measure. <laughs> well, hands is how, how we think, right? Without our hands, we're, you know, we're not human. Right? I mean, it's been, there have been great books about the, how the, the hand and the brain have evolved together, the opposable thumb. And oh, that, there's that's a... That's not the whole avenue of thought. In, uh, in an evolutionary science, there's a lot about the relationship between hands and speech. Um, as if you can't, can't do speech without the hands. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, well, there's that fantastic, like the best, worst written best book ever called The Craftsman by Richard Sennett. I don't know if you got to read that one. I know who he is, but I haven't read that. It's a great premise, and he goes extensively into conversation, into thought about the, um, about the hand and how it's an extension of a mind. Well, if you get into, uh, If you find a civilization that made tools, you can be sure <coughs> that they could speak. It, speech is, uh, I don't know why I'm going off on this, <laughs> speech is the primal artifact. And only when you have speech can you make other Artifacts, whether it's an axe or a 747 air, airplane, uh, it's a whole universe. Now, but it's, it's, it runs against the the science of painting, which is I keep being told I don't really understand what it means that, that it at right brain activity. Because they asked it, well, anyway. Well, we, we build a 747 by cooperating with each other. You can't, no man can build a 747 by himself. Probably and can't build an axe either without uh, 
Honey, right. hand, hand me that uh, plate. Right, it takes. <laughs> and so that speech, and that's how we dominate is through cooperation. Hey, Tom. Uh, speaking of speech and hands, I wanted to <laughs> see if anybody wanted to raise their hand and ask uh, questions of either of these two gentlemen in the remaining time that we have. Uh, Ms. Wolf wrote the first great piece about the excesses of art collecting in 1968 about the skulls. And I was wondering if when you witnessed that excess, if you ever imagined that it could just keep going and keep going and keep going. That book had absolutely no effect. <laughs> Zero. Uh, it did keep going uh, and going and going uh, uh, <clears throat> until until you have things uh, like no hands are. I mean, when you consider that Jeff Koons now has 120 people, that's the last figure I saw, working for him, and that they do uh, drawings that he indicates uh, the conception of uh, on a computer. And then they use uh, computers, and so you have are those drawings by Jeff Koons? Who can say? Uh, but it's a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a huge operation. And that's as big an operation as, um, the biggest operation as in any of the great Italians of the Renaissance. Yeah, they, had, they had lots of, lots of folks. Raphael had lots of folks. Um, but, uh, that, it, 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 that, that beats all. And who would have ever seen him coming along 20, 30 years ago when I, when I wrote that book? I'd like to ask both the Toms, um, you discussed the diminishment of, oh, sorry, uh, the end of newspapers and the diminishment of newspapers. Uh, I know the book by Richard said it, totally unreadable and I love him. Worst written, it's best terrible. book. It's such a good idea. <laughs> Worst crafted. So, but the, 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 the craftsman is about exactly what you're talking about, about hands and having a sensitivity for materials, etc. So what I want to ask you is, Given the diminishment of these skills or time to look at these things, what else do you think we're losing? And is it lost or is something else replacing it that you are excited about that is a good thing? Or is it all downhill from here? Well, one, one big problem, I think, is that the uh, you I got the wrong tone. <laughs> one, um, one big um, problem is what I, is I call digital knitting. And that's what all these things are. The, the, the digital telephones, Instagram, tweet, Twitter, um, Twitter um, um, and a number of others I, I really don't understand how to use. It gives people a way to, you know, knitting used to be a woman's occupation uh, to, to kill time with, but at the end, at least, you got a pair of socks. <laughs> but in all the killing time today, you don't get anything. Um, and the information is probably bad, too. Uh, this is a strange time. Well, I'd see it another way, and that's the, um, sure, all the best artists are in Silicon Valley. None of them are wasting their time making sculptures, like, paintings and stuff. They're making iPhones and inventing um, things like Uber that change the way we get around. But the other side is that all of this information has opened up a world of possibilities and it's this incredible research tool. And and maybe it's a, in a way a reaction against some of this, of the bullshit of Twitter and the emptiness and all that. And that's, it really is empty. Um, the putty, I call it. Um, oh wait, I'm in an elevator for 45 seconds. I can be doing something with this time, checking Instagram or whatever. But um, what we found is that there's all this information, and that's why we have this incredible, pardon the expression, artisanal movement. We've got people making their own 
um, knives and butchering their own animals and and knitting if you want to get a uh, the face hugger from an alien um, knit into a sweater and a reverse hoodie that you can pull over your face you can find someone who will knit you that on um, <laughs> Etsy. <laughs> Etsy, it's like an eBay, but it's really for craft, and it's a lot of it, most of it's crap, but you can find some great, you can find a woman in Iowa who's, who's retired who will knit you whatever you want, you can build a relationship with her and she can make that because she's been knitting her whole life and you have access to that now, if you're willing to dig a little bit. So, <coughs> And artists have always been solitary people. Even someone like Andy Warhol, who was a huge celebrity even in his time. Ultimately, you have time by yourself. You know, when you're writing or drawing, it's by yourself. And I don't, I don't think that's changed. It's just a different way of negotiating the world, a more superficial, quick, shittier way. But the information is there. You might have to. You know, the websites only take you so far. It might eventually, you might have to buy a book, which is just like a computer, except it's made of paper. <laughs> Keep turning the screens over and over again. You, you mentioned the Warhol. I think back to the, the fact that if he appeared, he, he understood something. If he appeared on a talk show, he would never talk. He'd whisper the answer into the ear of whatever associate he brought, uh, uh, brought with him. Uh, and there are some people like Andy Warhol who cannot improve in other people's estimation by talking on a talk show. Uh, for Elvis Presley never went on a talk show. It could only decrease uh, his, his, his standing. Um, now everyone is including me, is so happy about being on a talk show. <laughs> you, you kill your reputation real fast. There's no rehearsal, just this one, one go. Other questions? Well, I think that um, wraps it up, and I, I want to say thank you to everybody, and especially thank you to these two gentlemen. Actually, the kind of stuff we think about at the academy all day, every day, both sides of it, each extreme, and how to apply it to our work. So um, this has been a wonderful evening talking about that. And um, lastly, come to take one, dude. <laughs> <laughs> all right.